All right. Greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here, Adams van Sale, here to shine some light on the goings on down south. And tonight we're going to be talking about shining a light on South Africa, but this time uh, on an international stage, and this stage being the UN. Uh, and to join me here to talk about that is Adams Roots, the head of policy and action at Afri Forum. Uh, to chat about in terms of what Afri Forum strategy will uh, is going forward in regards to international uh, awareness making in terms of uh, minority rights in South Africa, and also to talk about his speech that he did last week at the UN. Um, and then also, uh, and I know a lot of people are tuning in for this as well, we're going to be talking about uh, the criminal charges that we will be laying against uh, Julius Malema tomorrow morning. Welcome to the show, Adams. Thank you. It's good to be here. Mm. So uh, let's start off uh, just to, to lay the foundation for the conversation. Um, how did Afri Forum get the opportunity to speak at the UN last week? Well, um, this the event we spoke at is the United Nations Forum on Minority Issues. It's a forum that we attend every year. Um, it's hosted by, by, well, by this um, particular forum, but sort of under the leadership of the Special Rapporteur on, on Minority Rights for the United Nations. And um, it's an event that we, as I said, we've been attending this every year, and each year there's a different topic. So every time it has something to do with regard to minority rights. Um, so this is not a direct consequence of the special consultative status that we have been granted with the United Nations earlier this year. Uh, this is an opportunity we would have had nonetheless. Um, but with this special, special consultative status that we do now have with the United Nations that we announced about a month ago, two months, maybe two months ago, uh, we will have access to a lot more such opportunities in the future. Mm. Right. Uh, so this year's theme at this uh, 13th session of the, the UN's um, minority rights, uh, minority issues session, the theme was hate speech, social media and minorities. Um, so did, Afri did your speech that you did there, was this specifically on hate speech in South Africa or did it focus on uh, social media specifically or what was the, the content of that speech? Yeah, so, so the focus was more on hate speech as such in South Africa than on on minor, uh, than on social media, although there was a reference to hate speech on social media. And uh, the fact that we what we regularly see in South Africa is when a farm murder is committed, for example, where you find people on social media celebrating it uh, or encouraging these murders on social media. We've all seen the kill the poor um, posts on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so I mentioned it, and then I explained that it goes. The problem in South Africa is, is goes far beyond posts on social media, uh, because there's something that's even more alarming than people saying these things on social media, and that's politicians saying these things on public platforms or at political rallies. So that was that was the focus of of, of uh, my presentation. We also had a slightly longer uh, written statement that we submitted to the UN and to the other parties or uh, organisations who participated. And many of them spoke about social media, and I think it's important to speak about social media and hate speech on social media and how do we deal with it. But, uh, but the South African problem of hate speech goes beyond nearly social media. Mm. And because of COVID regulations, uh, you weren't able to fly all the way to Switzerland, uh, but uh, you were able to do a video feed. Uh, so you were talking live uh, to a, an audience, uh, as it will. But uh, in terms of this platform, uh, do you think that this platform that uh, Afri Forum was uh, fortunate enough to be able to use, um, do you think some influential people were listening? Do you think this is a, a big step towards uh, getting the, the uh, information out there in regards to uh, the issue of hate speech in South Africa towards minorities? Yes. Well, we've said this many times that there's no silver bullet. There's not one thing that you can do that will solve all the problems in South Africa. Um, and speaking at a UN conference is, won't solve everything, but it certainly is a big step uh, in the right direction. And we've learned from the ANC in this regard. We know that was sort of the part of the, you could say the cornerstone of the ANC strategy in the, the 70s and 80s was international liaison and getting more and more international support. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a slow process. It's something that, that builds, uh, you, you attend one conference after the other and you build your networks and and, um, and we've been doing this for a few years and um, and so I do think it's very it's it's a very important event for us and yes we do get the opportunity to liaise and speak with 
with some other organizations and to, to grow our networks and to expose people to information about uh, um, uh, or bring people in contact with, with information about what's happening in South Africa so that they can take take note of this and also also make a public stand, uh, take a public stance on this. And in that way, also influence what the ANC describes as the balance of forces in South Africa. In other words, putting more and more international pressure on, on the ANC and on the ruling party and, and the South African government for that matter. Hmm. That term you use there, the balance of forces, that's something that I've seen increasingly being used in uh, opinion pieces, analysis, uh, in AfriForum's reports as well, in terms of the South African situation when it comes to politics. Maybe uh, for those that aren't uh, in the know, uh, could you explain what the, the balance of forces is in the context of South Africa and how it relates to the ANC? Yeah, so, so the balance of forces is a term um, that that. The ANC takes from it comes. It's a Cold War term. The ANC takes it from the Soviet Union, um, and they've made it part of their terminology. As many of most of the the, the phrases uh, is the case with. Um, and what the balance of forces essentially means is you have to consider the power balance. So what the ANC says is they have this goal. They want to promote a national democratic revolution in South Africa, which very simplified means. They want to use democracy to have a socialist revolution. That's basically what it means. Um, so they want to have this national democratic revolution. But also, if it's a democracy, you can't just do what you want. Or at least you have to sort of have this um, flair of democracy or create this impression that you are still Democrats or committed to democratic values. So what the ANC then says, and, and they say this publicly, you can find it on their website, is that they, have, they want to push this revolution but they can't just do everything at once because that would be that would create too much of a backlash and it would be bad for them. So what they do is they, they, they do this, this revolution gradually um, through policy changes, like we've seen now one of the major steps was, of course, this whole thing about Section 25 of the Constitution. Um, and, and what they do essentially is they, they see, they check the public reaction. And to the extent that there's a massive public reaction or a backlash, that means the balance of forces is against them. Um, and to the extent that there's not a big backlash, it means the balance of forces are in their favor. And in, and in as far as the balance of forces are against them, they backpedal. And we've seen that. They've had some, we, we tend to forget about the victories we've had um, over the last few years. One major victory was the secrecy bill, where uh, if you read the bill, the way it was published initially, it was basically about giving any state institution, which includes, I mean, hundreds of them, but it includes, for example, the shark board in KwaZulu Natal and, and such institutions. The idea of the ANC, or the, yeah, the ANC, you could say, was to give any state institution the, the power to declare any piece of information as secret or top secret. They had these categories. And then if you as a member of the public or if you're a journalist you publish that information um you would commit a crime and you would you can go to prison and that was something they pushed i think in 2012 and they were quite adamant and aggressive on this another thing another example related to this was this idea of a government enforced media tribunal and eventually they backed down and they changed their policy on this there's not there's not a, a serious attempt currently to have a, a government enforced media tribunal. In other words, for the government to regulate the media in South Africa, maybe we'll hear some of that in future again. And this secrecy bill has been watered down to such an extent that it's not really a very controversial bill anymore. Um, and, and that's because the balance of forces was just too much against it. So that's what we mean when we say we can influence the balance of forces. It means just getting more and more, putting more and more pressure on, on, on government. And we have seen that um, they are very sensitive to international criticism to the extent that uh, these, um, these conferences we've attended, uh, they, we've seen the South African government, they send representatives to attend them with us, to, to follow us, to see what we discuss. And at this one also, although it was online, um, it, it, the South African government was also tuned in. They were logged in the entire conference. Uh, um, so it, it just shows to us that they do take this seriously. Mm. Uh, that balance of forces that you explained actually sounds a lot like a classic tactic we've seen from uh, tyrannical regimes across history and that's the that tactic of you don't get someone one kilometer in one direction by just shoving them uh, 
in one direction in one in one foul swoop you do it by pushing them one centimeter at a time and then when you get resistance you kind of wait for them to calm down first and then you push a little more and when you get resistance you wait and we're definitely seeing that type of uh, tactic from the ANC for the past uh, 30 years or so uh, but then you also have to take into in, into consideration as you mentioned the ANC doesn't seem very uh, adept at dealing with criticism from abroad. I mean, you can take, for example, that tweet from uh, Donald Trump in 2018 when he mentioned South Africa. Um, and the, the ANC, or I think Sora Ramaphosa, wrote like four letters and wrote a bunch of opinion pieces and uh, did a bunch of interviews after that to almost do damage control. But you could see that the ANC wasn't really uh, prepared for that type of criticism. Because um, they've been the darlings of the international community for so long that I don't think they're used to it. Um, and I think that's where AfriForum strategy comes in. So when people are, for example, pessimistic in regards to uh, AfriForum's awareness campaigns, uh, what is AfriForum's philosophy around that type of awareness, uh, awareness campaigns, like, for example, the world must know? Well, the point is to, to get more and more international support. There's a few things that we want to achieve through international campaigns. Uh, one is to get governments to take a stance on what is happening in South Africa, to take a stance on, for example, farm murders or um, expropriation without compensation. And we have achieved a degree of success on that. Um, so, so that's one. I mean, we've had these, uh, uh, when I say we, I mean this whole movement against what the ANC is doing. Um, we've had. Uh, the Australian government and the and, and Netherlands, the Dutch government, uh, passed motions on this. We've seen, for example, the tweet by Donald Trump. There was a lot of talk about. There has been a lot of talk to date about this in the USA, um, and I still think one of our missions is to get the the um, US to get the House or the Senate or and or the Senate in the US to pass a motion on on what's happening through their foreign affairs committees, and as a result of that influencing the balance of forces. So that's one one reason why we have these international campaign, campaigns. Another reason is um, in informing the world. Um, we know there's a lot of, there's increased interest in what is happening in South Africa, especially we've seen it with uh, this year when we had these Black Lives Matter movements and, and, and we found all these groups, especially Black Lives Matter. You, you, there were people in the US, Americans in the US saying, why aren't we talking more about the farmers who are being murdered in South Africa as well? Um, so we want awareness so that people can talk about this more to, to influence uh, public opinion. We also want to liaise with not only governments, but 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 um, people in the media, think tanks, researchers, politicians, and, and so forth. And, and there's another thing that's important is it's also showing, it, well, one thing is showing to our members and people in South Africa that they aren't alone, that there are people across the world who are concerned about this. And then also to show to people abroad how they can contribute, whether that be financially or, in other words, helping to fund court cases and so, and, and so forth, or um, contributing by, for example, and this is something that, that really makes an impact if you are a US citizen by calling your representative in Washington saying, listen, uh, I'm from your state, I voted for you, or you represent my, uh, no, no, I, li I live in the state that you have to represent. I want you to, to take a firm stance about what is happening in South Africa. And we do know some people in the USA have been doing this. And we know this because some of the senators and people in the representatives in, in the House, um, House of Representatives have told us, uh, they said to us, they said, we are getting emails from our constituents asking us to take a stance on about the farm murders and about land reform in South Africa. and. And um, this, I think this is important. It's an important way to put pressure on, on the South African government. No, we're not saying that that um, informing people across the world or informing the UN is going to solve everything. But it certainly, if you do it right and if you do it strategically, it is. It, it has the capacity to make a very big impact. And then also some big news in regards to Afri Forum's. Uh campaign to bring awareness internationally is that AfriForum became a member of ECOSOC uh, earlier this year. Um, could you maybe elaborate in terms of what that means and uh, how that was achieved? Because uh, there seems to be, I think, in one of the media uh, statements, uh, it was uh, stated that uh, there were a lot of obstacles being put in the way of AfriForum yeah. uh, in this pursuit by the ANC itself, if you could elaborate on that. 
Yes, well, I think the one important thing is to, to, to explain it properly. It doesn't mean that AfriForum is a member of the United Nations. Um, AfriForum has been granted special consultative status. So what that means is that uh, we are now recognized by ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council, which is one of the six main bodies of, of the, the United Nations. There's the, the General Assembly in which all the states uh, gather then there's the uh, Security Council, there's the Secretariat where the, the Secretary General works and sort of an executive, you could call it that. There's the Human Rights Council, there's the, um, what is the trustee, what do they call it? Uh, it's like a board of trustees. And then there's ECOSOC. So ECOSOC is one of the major bodies of the United Nations. And, and part of this forum, the NGO branch, as they call it, has to do with with empowering or, or amplifying the voices of minorities not only minorities but ngos uh, non-governmental organizations and i think that's part of the problem with the us or the criticism of the us is it's basically a an international forum for states it's not so much we we the peoples it's we the states it's different governments meeting and having discussions um, to a large extent at least and, and EcoSoc and the, the NGO branch is an attempt to, to remedy this, to provide a platform for organizations whose views aren't necessarily represented by their governments, although a lot of these NGOs are aligned with their governments or supported by their governments, some of them aren't. And yes, it was a major, well, let me just say this before I get to, to the, the path to getting there. What this effectively means is we get access, we have much bigger access to the United Nations than we had before that, uh, access to meetings, access to, to informal opportunities as well, access to, to an extent to resources at the United Nations, to the library of the United Nations, things like that, to the offices um, uh, in certain conditions um, uh, or the office buildings. Uh, so we will we will be we will have a much more comprehensive United Nations strategy in the years to follow. And I know the US, the UN gets gets um, uh, there's concern. People saying, well, the UN has their own agenda and, and, and so forth, and it's a concern for us as well. But the UN is also a major, a massive international body for for people from all spheres of life coming together. Uh, not coming, not only coming together, but having discussions, um, including Afri Forum um, and other organisations, other minority groups as well. So it, it does provide us with the opportunity to to liaise, to build networks, to to to, uh, to build bridges with with organisations and governments and researchers and journalists and representatives and, and other influential people who are sympathetic to our cause to, to get them to also speak out about this. Um, in terms of the, the, the road, if I might just add on, on the, the difficulty we've had to achieving this, um, I think the first, not I think, I know, the first time I attended this um, uh, forum to get this status was in 2012, the end of January 2012, we applied for special consultative status in 2011. Um, so it's literally had, it's been from 2011 to now. And one of the reasons why, not one of the reasons, the reason why it took so long is because the South African government took deliberate steps to prevent us from registering. And this is not a speculation. We know this because they said so. Um, the representatives of the South African government actually came to me and in the, at the UN headquarters in New York. And they said to me, well, this represents the city. Listen, I've been given instructions from Pretoria that I need to, to ensure that you guys don't get through because you guys are too arrogant, those were his words. Um, and so they kept uh, delaying us. They couldn't really reject us because we complied with, with the requirements. So they kept delaying us and and um, eventually it took us nine years, but it was a massive break. Mm. And I think, uh, yeah, you touched on it, but I think there's something else that's also very important. That's the, the issue of legitimacy. So when uh, Afri Forum goes on uh, our next liaison tour, whether that be to the US or to somewhere in Europe, um, this type of membership gives you that uh, the credentials or the CV to show that you're the real deal. It uh, actually give, gives you access to a lot more ears than you would have in the past. Uh, I mean, uh, when you're up against a, a massive propaganda campaign against you in the, in the mainstream media, both domestically and abroad, um, it kind of throws a spanner in the works when you've got uh, this type of backing or this type of CV uh, when you arrive yeah. there in a, in a foreign country to try and uh, spread awareness or to get the ear of uh, some politician or influential think tank there. It, it really is something that you can put on your CV and it does give you a lot more credibility. 
um, it's something that that you they actually explain it in in the letter that we received when we were granted the status that we can put it on our letterhead. Uh, we can say uh, so when we when we engage with organisations in, in other countries or we reach out to some politician or some think tank or whoever, some researcher or journalist. We can actually add onto our letterhead. We can say every forum, and then we can say an organisation with special consultative status at, at the United Nations. Um, and it just it just gives us a lot more credibility. So not only will this um, directly um, open doors at the UN in terms of meetings that we are now allowed to attend that we weren't allowed to attend before, it will also open doors for us in the sense that it'll be it, it will be easier for us to get meetings with people across the world, uh, given the fact that you, that you can add this to your resume and you can say this on your, on your later head as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, so uh, Every Forum had a very successful uh, The World Must Know campaign this year. It was not Every Forum's first liaison to it to the US, it was actually the second. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like there are increasing amounts of friends uh, of Every Forum uh, out there in regards to these types of tours. That's also one of the other things that they achieve is the fact that when you go there, you can get new, you can network with people that are interested, get the contact details of people that want to spread awareness about South Africa in those countries as well. And it gives you that uh, it gives you that network where when you want to get a new story out there to, for example, publications in America, like, for example, you want Tucker Carlson to report on something, you can send them that uh, and they will take it on to, into consideration. And I think mm -hmm. AfriForum has made leaps and bounds in regards to uh, gaining allies all across the world. It seems like we have a lot more people uh, listening to what's happening in South Africa from AfriForum uh than we had just a few years ago it seems like uh, it's becoming uh, when people mention afri forum in foreign circles it seems like it's ringing a bell it's not just a uh, some nobody organization anymore yes um well to to give you to give some perspective when we planned the u.s tour this year um we we, we we have all the, we have the, the information on a spreadsheet of course and we, while we were planning this we actually discovered that we have about a hundred i think it was slightly over a hundred potential meetings in washington um and some in new york as well of course um and so we, we're now at the point where when we go to to washington we we can't speak with everyone we know there because we don't even if you go for two weeks there's not enough time to have to have meetings follow-up meetings with with all the people with whom we have had discussions in the past and with whom we are still in contact. So I think people underestimate the extent to which we have a, a, a network there. Um, but the good news about that is you can prioritize. It's a good problem to have not to be able to see everyone because it means that you, you can prioritize and you can you can see where, where will it have the biggest impact. And um, we obviously we have contacts in other countries as well. We've had um, lies and tours to all over the world. Um, but I think we, um, I think we must we must build on this, and and we've had I mean we've seen this the success, the the, the um, exposure we've had on, for example, you mentioned Tucker Carlson on Tucker Carlson tonight. It's not just something, it's not just arriving in Washington and saying hey we uh, let's have an interview, and um, it's having gone there uh, years before and building up um, relationships and building up credibility and convincing people that you are credible. And um, and through that, you people introduce you to each other, and people or people introduce you to more people, and they, you know, they, and that, that's something that I think is really that we are really grateful for. Some of our friends in, in other countries really put effort into helping us um, spread the message by sending emails around. We've had people in the House of Representatives, for example, sending emails to a whole bunch of representatives there, saying, "Listen, we spoke with Africa before. You should speak with them as well." We've had people do that. In the Senate in the US, we've had people do that with media institutions. Um, so it's it's all it's about developing a network and, and and gradually or organically growing the network. And and you can see the the fruits of that through um, interviews uh, or through through um, the fact that we you know, we've had this breakthrough with uh, this um, the fact that we were able to attend CPAC and we were able to meet with a lot of people at CPAC and you can see the fruits of that. In, in a variety of ways. One of it is just through media exposure. Mm, absolutely. And then also, uh, I joked about this after Sienecal, uh, but it actually came true. 
I said when the, the EFF sang Kill the Boer at Sierra Cold 2, I said actually uh, that um, I, I thank the EFF mocking me that they gave us all this content and all this material that we now can go see, uh, go show the, the UN because they've just exposed themselves in regards to what they were about. But then yeah. on that matter of Sierra Cold, uh, and Kill the Boer being sung there, uh, I know years back Afri Forum had that court case against Julius Malema when he was still in the ANC. Uh, regarding the singing of Kill the Boer. Uh, and there is a lot of talk around that song now again, now that it has uh, emerged. Um, in regards to Afri Forum's uh, achievement in that court case back in the day uh, and how it applies to today, could you maybe clear up some, some misinformation or uh, uh, miscommunication or any type of uh, unclarities in, in that regard? Yes, that's important. And um, the, I think that court case was a massive breakthrough for Afri Forum. And sometimes we get questions about that, and I've seen some people have some. I've seen people with some conspiracy theories about that, and it's actually quite simple what happened there. And and we're actually now we're now in a position to be able to use that. Um, so what happened? It it was about the singing of the song Dubula Ibulu in 2010 by Julius Malema um, at I think probably like five or six political gatherings. The first one was at his birthday party. Actually, it was not really published. The second one was at UJ, uh, I think the 9th of March, 2010, if I recall. Um, and then thereafter, he had a few public meetings where he sang the song, Dubla And, you know, they would make the hand gestures with a firearm and so forth. So we filed a complaint of hate speech. Um, and interesting, the AMC actually came to, to the matter on their own accord. They actually said, we also endorse this song so if you want to file, if you want to take up the matter with the courts, you have to add us as a respondent as well. So they literally voluntarily added themselves to the court case to defend the song. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's an interesting perspective. And what happened there was, of course, the court case was, was I think, the first live streamed court case in South Africa. It was a massive spectacle, I remember. Um, uh, I had to testify in that case about uh, you know why the reform fi reform filing the complaint and all of that. And outside the court, it was the Johannesburg court. Outside the court, in the streets, they had they had put up um, these massive screens. Um, it was like a music show or something. It, well, that's what it what it seemed like. But then they literally live streamed the court case outside onto the street. In the like it was like a sporting event. Yeah, it seemed like that. And there were thousands of people sitting in the street watching the, the court case. Um, and so we won that case. Uh, Judge Colin Lamont made a ruling in the case of Afri Forum versus Malema. People can go look it up um, about why this song is hate speech, and he dismissed the ANC and Malema's arguments uh, in his judgment. And this is important to understand what happened there. You have to differentiate between a, a judgment and an order. You talk about a court case. So the judgment is the explanation and the findings by the judge. And then the order is the little paragraph at the end that say, basically says, because of this judgment, the following now has to happen. Um, so we need to differentiate there. So he, he explained in his judgment, this is HB and all of that. And he made an order that, that basically said, the ANC and Malema cannot, are not allowed to sing this song. It's, um, the song is declared hate speech. So if they do, in other words, it will be, they will commit contempt of court. So that's round one. What happened then was the ANC and Malema um, Malema was then president of the ANC, but we, we filed a complaint against him as an individual and then the ANC joined. Uh, they then went to, they then filed an appeal. They went to the Supreme Court of Appeal. We uh, uh, um, opposed the appeal. And before the matter was heard in the Supreme Court of Appeal, um, we, uh, the court actually gave instruction that, that the parties have to sit around the table before the court proceedings commence to see if they can have some form of a settlement. Now, we weren't very optimistic about reaching a settlement on this issue because the only possible settlement for us could be they have to stop singing the song. And it turns out that's what happened. And we spoke about the balance of forces earlier. Um, and I think the balance of forces was just too too much against them at the time. Um, so at the settlement, because it was, it was news all over the world, it was international news, uh, this whole story about the ANC's court battle to have the right to sing about shooting boys or farmers. That's what the story was. That's how it was, how it was portrayed all over the world. 
And, and then during the, um, and now it's, it's news again that they want to appeal this, they haven't learned their lesson and all of that. So during this, this discussions we had, um, uh, they actually said that they are going to stop singing this song. So we said, well, it's, well, this is fine. We can play this around the table. It's not going to make much of a difference. We have to make it a food order. So the consequence of that was that the agreement was then made or this concession uh, on their behalf was then made a, an order of the Supreme Court of Appeals. So what that means practically is the judgment of the, the case which found the matter to be hate speech is still in place. The actual forum versus Palema judgment is still valid. It still uh, counts as authority. It still creates a precedent. We can still use that judgment. Uh, but the order, the part at the bottom where the court said, now you are not allowed to sing this, was replaced with a, a settlement agreement which was then made um, a, an order of the Supreme Court of Appeals. In other words, it's a higher court with more authority. Uh, so that, that's the first thing. The second thing is it was made broader than that. It's not only applicable to Dubla Ibunu, it's now applicable to similar songs. In other words, it's now applicable also to uh, One Settler, One Bullet, to Kill the Bird, Kill the Farmer, to all these other songs, which weren't initially. Um, so that, that was an improvement on, on, on the order and as far as we are concerned. And, and thirdly, also, the fact that this was a settlement also neutralized the possibility that the Supreme Court of Appeal or eventually the Constitutional Court could overturn the initial ruling or the initial judgment and say, no, this is not a speech. So they cannot overturn it now because they've agreed to this settlement agreement. So that's, that's sort of the story on, on where we are. And I think that settlement is useful because if, they, if Malema now sings Dubla Ibunu or similar songs, he, he's not only committing hate speech, he's also guilty of contempt of court. Uh, and also what that settlement also said is that uh, Malema and the ANC have to encourage, I think it says, educate their supporters about these songs, but also encourage them to refrain from singing such songs. So in other words, if Malema, according to this settlement, if Malema does not encourage his supporters to refrain from singing songs like Kill the World, Kill the Farmer, that means he's in contempt of court. So that means he's committed. Mm. But now, this finding, what are those implications then for the singing of Kill the Bird Sinekal earlier this year? Yeah, exactly. And that's why I think this, this settlement is relevant now again. So we have written, and I don't, we haven't announced this publicly. So this is the first time we've made this information um, available to the public. We, we have written an attorney's letter to Julius Malema. Um, after Sinekal and we gave him time to respond until the 30th of November and we said to him listen well you would remember that there, there's a settlement which has been made in order of the court that you have to encourage your members to, not to sing this songs like these um, so we are now and it, remember it's a legal process that you have to that you have to follow um, uh, you can't just run to court immediately you have to follow the, the necessary legal procedures so we've sent the, in this attorney letter, uh, attorney's letter. We'll see how he responds by the 30th. If he doesn't respond by saying he's going to stop singing this song and he's going to, to uh, or at least he's going to encourage the EFF not to sing this song. So if he doesn't res respond appropriately, uh, we can we can take up the matter further. We can we can again file, file a complaint of hate speech, which if we win, we can get a court court order that he has to pay damages to an organization that works with the victims of farm attacks, for example, um, and so forth. But it's more than that now. It's also contempt of court. So we can go we can go through that proceedings and actually have him found guilty of having committing having committed the crime, contempt of court. And hate speech by definition it's it's a bit technical that hate speech isn't a crime as such. But but contempt of court is a crime. Mm. Um, and then speaking of court cases as well, uh, you announced earlier today on Twitter that uh, Free Forum will be laying criminal charges against uh, Julius Malema uh, for his uh, speech this week uh, regarding police officers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the reaction that I've seen to, in regards to his speech seems to be that a lot of people think that this time uh, he's given himself a very little uh, wiggle room in regards to, to defending what he said. Um, but yeah. I mean, we could, you could say that about a lot of things that he said in the past. So my big question there then is, when you look at, for example, the, the court cases that are, are currently uh, that are going against uh, Julius Malema, and this one seeming uh, is going to add to it, um, 
or it maybe before we get to that uh, maybe can you just uh, give us some context in regards to uh, the criminal uh, criminal charges that you will be laying tomorrow at uh, in uh, centurion i think yeah so uh, we will we'll be filing the complaint tomorrow morning um, and it's for incitement of violence and uh, conspiracy to commit crime and also intimidation. And it's about Malema's comments in Brackenfell, where he, he spoke about, basically about attacking the police. He said, yeah, we, we must remember, or they, the police, must, must remember what, they, what happened when, when the, the struggle movement or the liberation movement, or however he defines it, fought against the police during the apartheid system and he, he explained they went to their houses and so forth and, and that happened. It happened in the 1980s that, that members of, of the ANC and the Congress and so forth actually went to especially black police officers' houses while they were sleeping, threw hand grenades through their windows, threw them up and their families or just shot them through their, their windows um, uh, while they were sleeping. Uh, that happened. It happened in South Africa and it was a very serious reality. And Malema was basically flirting, saying, not only suggesting, basically saying that the EFF is prepared to do the same thing. Um, so this is clearly an example of, of incitement to violence and conspiracy to the crimes and intimidation. And it is something, I think the interesting thing is he's making his, um, his, his circle of enemies bigger and bigger um, to the extent that you can only have so many enemies. And... Um, I mean, he should have been prosecuted a long time ago, and our private prosecutions unit is looking into it. But but making threats about killing the police is is a is a big hurdle to cross, and um, I think there's going to be consequences for him for this. Hmm. Um, but then also talking about uh, these types of court cases, I know the uh, we all wish that the law moved a bit faster there, or justice moved a bit faster than it does in South Africa. But there's a lot of court cases going on in regards to Julius Malema from Afri Forum side. Uh, there's the, the assault of that police officer case, and there's also the, the case of uh, when he shot that firearm into the air. Uh, what's the progress on those two court cases? Yes, so, so there's a few cases. There's actually more than one case of assault. With, with Julius Malema, the one is now in, in court, uh, the one of assault, uh, where at the funeral of Winnie Mandela, he and Mbuya Sen and Lozi went to the funeral and there was a, a police colonel who happens to be white, who I believe was, was regulating the vehicle traffic and I think he was trying to say to them, where can they park uh, or something like that. And he got out and Malema got out and Mbuya Sen and Lozi and they started beating him up. Um, and the, actually, there was no progress on that matter, no, no substantial progress until Africa Forum's private prosecution unit became involved and um, putting pressure on the, the, the prosecuting authority saying, well, if you're not going to prosecute him, we're going to prosecute him. And now we are at the point where he is being prosecuted, where he has been in court. He has appeared in court twice now um, for the matter to be heard. Uh, the matter is still, it's still on. Um, I think within the next year, probably the matter will be resolved. And I don't see no reason to get out of that one. And I think this shooting of the farm is probably worse. And it's the same uh, just a bit behind the word that hasn't been argued, but I'm sure we'll reach that point. Um, and um, I look at the the casings were picked up on the scene where he fired that firearm. Um, so, so, um, and I think the evidence is there. Um, so, I think that one's going to turn out quite badly for him. And then I think this one is also not going to be to be good. So, the pro it, it is a problem in South Africa. I'm not, I'm not overly opportunistic about the legal system because I do know that we have some serious problems with people being prosecuted or not being prosecuted for political reasons. Um, and I think Malema should have been prosecuted a long time ago, but it, it's not as if there's nothing happening. It's just a slow, a slow progress. And um, I think if we, uh, from as a foreign side, we regard this as one of our major priorities. So, um, and Harry Nell's office is, is, they have big tabs on this. So I'm sure we will, we will by by next year this time, I think we will have some interesting progress to to report back on and to discuss what happened in the past year. Mm. Uh, then also there's another court case uh, that uh, we attended actually not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, and that's the court case uh, that's still going on regarding BLF 
Uh, and that's the way uh, Andiling Zitama uh, told his followers that uh, for every black person killed, uh, they should go kill five white people. Um, yeah. And I know that court case was supposed to, to uh, not conclude, but uh, uh, should have ended a few, uh, a few weeks ago, but it's still going on. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going on now in the 9th of December, we're going to be back in court. Uh, but what's still left in that court case before we will maybe get a, a judgment there? Yes, well, that court case is basically finished. Um, I believe it's this coming week uh, is the final court date, unless uh, Andile and Pekama and, and DLF's legal team prolong the matter. Um, where we are now is I'm still in, in, in I'm still giving evidence uh, or testimony in the matter. I've been in the box for I think two and a half days by now. Um, having to give oral evidence and I'm, I've been cross-examined for more than a day now so far and so what what the what their lawyer said is that they will conclude their cross-examination the next time we're in court and then they will make their closing arguments I'm not sure if they're going to call witnesses I don't think so but what should happen um, if there's no surprises in the court case is by next week we will conclude the arguments in that case and then uh, judgment will probably be postponed. I'm sure it will be. What that means is that the magistrate, in this case, it's not a judge, it's a magistrate, will, will then say, listen, she needs time to go and write a judgment. And then I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know, maybe February or March in 2021, we'll, we'll be called back and then she'll give a ruling on the matter. And I'm very optimistic about that case. I've, I mean, what, what this guy said, he said, we're going to kill five whites for every black person who gets killed. We, he said, you must come with me, I'm going, to, I'm going to show you who to stab. That's what he said. He said, we'll kill their wives, we'll kill their children, we'll kill their dogs, we'll kill their cats. And I've said this repeatedly during the court proceedings. If, if this is not hate speech, nothing is hate speech. What, what else can be hate speech if this isn't hate speech? If you openly say, we're going to go to the suburbs where the white people live, we're going to start killing them, and you must come with me, and I'm going to show you where they are, and then, and then you will kill them. I'm going to help you to kill them and all of that. So, so I think we're going to win that case. I think we're going to get a court order against, uh, or at least an order that the Andire would have to apologize for being making such racist comments, which I think would be funny. I also, we've also asked him to for a court order that he has to pay five hundred thousand rand in damages um, to an organisation that works with victims of. Uh, genocide or, or hate speech uh, or minority rights. Uh, we are considering the uh, what we suggested in court would be the, uh, uh, the, the Center for Prevention of Genocide in uh, that is linked to the Holocaust Memorial uh, in, in, in Johannesburg. Uh, because he also made some atrocious comments about Jews and the Jewish community and Hitler and so forth. Um, uh, so I think we're going to succeed in that, and if they aren't able to pay, we'll be able to send uh, to send the sheriff to, to his house to confiscate his belongings, to sell his belongings. Um, and I, I, I think that's what's going to happen, unless by some very strange turn of events, the magistrate finds that if you say, come with me and let's kill the whites, I'm going to show you where they are, we'll kill their wives, and we'll kill their dogs, and we'll kill their cats by some strange reasoning that isn't hate speech, but I doubt that that could be done. I think something that uh, I also want to discuss with you, Adams, is uh, more of a risk or a danger that's developing in South Africa. When you see institutions like, for example, the South African Human Rights Commission not really doing yeah. uh, what they were supposed to do, or really seeing some strange uh, court judgments as well, uh, becoming increasingly strange, you could also say that. Um, so, and that's, that's a big concern because the the only thing that really separates people or that stops people from uh, using violence to pretty much solve their, their disputes is that you have these types of institutions that, I mean, that's their role. But when these types of institutions start failing or when they start becoming ideologically possessed or captured, um, that creates a very dangerous environment for where, when people can't then rely on these institutions anymore and then they're going to take justice into their own hands. Um, what do you foresee in the future in regards to this concern or this risk and what is uh, AfriForum's stance regarding it? Yeah, um, well, I'm trying to get something here, maybe to read it out. Um, I think it's about the, um, the, um, the Human Rights Commission, which has really become 
part of the problem. Um, in, mm. in, I mean, uh, they, they made that statement a while back regarding Julius Malema. I think it's regarding his uh, speech where he said, uh, we're not calling for the slaughter of yep. whites, at least for now. Yep. And then they uh, they pretty much essentially said that um, the the race of the perpetrator and the race of the victim will determine what their, yeah. their judgment is in regards to hate speech. Well, here's the latest comment by, by the Human Rights Commission on that. So I pointed that out at this UN conference. I said the Human Rights Commission is not the solution. It's part of the problem in South Africa because it has publicly stated that the race of the perpetrator should be a determining factor on whether something is hate speech or not. And Malema is black, therefore it's not hate speech. That's basically what the Human Rights Commission said in its finding or the ruling in March 2019. Um, so I said the Human Rights Commission is part of the problem for this reason, and they responded. They were very angry with me, and they issued a press statement. And here's just one comment. This is a quote I'm reading from a news article. So it starts with a quote. It says, and it's sort of defending their position on hate speech and having race being the determining factor. Um, um, Majola, who's, um, who's the, the chairperson of, of um, the Human Rights Commission, um, said, the commission objectively determined that the statement, now that's the statement here is Malema saying, we're not calling for the slaughter of whites, at least for now. The Human Rights Commission said it's not hate speech because Malema is black. So they, he says, the commission objectively determined that the statement meant that whereas peaceful black Africans were killed like animals by white colonists, Malema is not calling for the, for the killing of white people now. What he is calling for is the peaceful occupation of land, said Majola. He added that it was important. Uh, Malema referred to white people's historic and not current conduct, and that white colonists occupied indigenous uh, land remains a fact. Now this sounds like the speech of an of a radical political activist, not a government human rights commission trying to objectively protect human rights. Um, so the human rights commission is is part of the problem. It's it's there's no doubt about that. The human rights commission cannot be trusted. Um, they try to involve us with discussions about Senegal, and we said to them we don't trust them. We don't want to be in discussions with the human rights commission because they they publicly endorse double standards. And I think we should point that out. I mean, we, we should, and people watching this, we should continue filing complaints with the Human Rights Commission uh, because they said, I mean, I mean, we can look at what reality is in, in this statement. They also seem to believe that white people encouraging violence towards black people is a much bigger crisis in South Africa than black people encouraging violence towards white people. And, and I, I honestly haven't seen that many white people saying, let's go and kill the blacks. Um, I, I don't see that. I think I've seen it maybe once. Uh, I saw someone posting something like that on, on social media. Um, and the Human Rights Commission is under the impression that white people you know, committing hate speech is a much more serious crisis than, than, than white people being the victims of hate speech. And I think we must point that out. I think we must continuously point out the Human Rights Commission that they are part of the problem. We mustn't trust it. I think we can continue filing complaints with the Human Rights Commission. Um, but we must have a, a sense of perspective when we discuss the human rights. But yeah, it, it is very concerning to see, for example, the developments that we saw in Brackenfeld uh, just a week ago. Uh, that's good. You're going to see more of those types of confrontations if you don't have these types of institutions doing their job. Uh, or if you don't have any type of supplement for that or any type of replacement. So, uh, and I think uh, AfriForum is more of the stance of we need something better or something else rather than how that we're going to fix these broken institutions that have been completely captured. I might be wrong in that assessment, but what is the yeah. solution then going forward in regards to uh, mitigating this very serious risk that uh, I outlined? Well, I think the the problem in South Africa is goes beyond who the governing party is, um, which party is ruling, um, is currently ruling the country. The problem of South Africa um, goes beyond, or, or let's rather say the, the solution for the problem in South Africa goes beyond simply getting another party to govern the country. The, the solution goes beyond simply upholding our rights as it's defined in the constitution and the problem because the problem with the constitution is you can you can read the same text and you can have multiple different interpretations there 
and who gets to interpret the constitution it's not us uh, it's 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 judges who are being um appointed based on their commitment to you could say a particular uh, left-wing progressive interpretation of the constitution if you are not committed to that interpretation of the constitution in other words if you're not committed to transformation you you won't be able to become a judge or you will have a very difficult time because you have to go through the judicial service commission so so the solution in south africa is is goes beyond that it, the solution in south africa is about um, communities taking control over uh, over things that are important to them not waiting for government to protect us but protecting ourselves I do think government is going to deteriorate more and more. They're going to lose power increasingly, although I think they are going to become more and more aggressive and they're going to, to have increasingly radical ideas, but they won't be able to enforce these ideas. Um, and their frustration with them not being able to enforce these ideas, their frustration with not having money because they keep stealing the money um, is going to, to lead to a situation where we are going to have a much more aggressive um, uh, government that will it's it's like a, a an injured buffalo it's like it's the metaphor we always use it's 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 at its most at its most dangerous when it's when it's um when it's hurt um, and i think that's the situation and i think the solution is is uh, i think we're going to have a, a degree of deterioration in this country and it's not necessarily a bad thing um if it if it means that we can have a better political system as a result thereof that's wonderful. We had a discussion about this today, actually, um, about post-communist um, Eastern Europe, where it seems Eastern Europe is now much more stable in a way, in a sense, than Western Europe. Um, I, I would rather go to Hungary and many of these countries than, than to France and, and, and England and so forth, at least for political stability. And I think it's because they went through this and and um, i mean eastern europe east of the berlin wall was, was pretty much destroyed as a result of communism and socialism and the same type of ideas that the south african government is flirting with but that led, led to a disillusionment a realization about certain realities that are being denied or suppressed by my ideology and 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 one of the main um, uh, realities that is being suppressed by by socialism but also by liberalism is the fact that people are community creatures. People want to live in community with others. People people want to identify with people in their community. They want to be proud of their history. They want to commemorate historical events. Um, they want to have traditions. They want to take part in traditions. But if you do these things today, you are described as a nationalist. Um, and and um, and you know, if you, well, if you do this, the ANC would describe you as a right wing or a racist or something. I mean, they can do it, but everyone else can't and and liberals who describe you as a nationalist um and i think that's just i think that's we have that's why we have this backlash all over the world now with brexit and with trump becoming president in 2016 and what's happening in in the netherlands and in italy and in hungary and in i mean we can go through the list um so so um i think i think there's some troubled times ahead but i think it's not necessarily bad and the two things that have dominated the, the news cycle, especially in our sphere of what uh, AfriForum keeps an eye on, is definitely the two Senegal gatherings and then also Brackenfell now, now more recently. Um, and this definitely seems like a symptom of uh, the pressure being built up and people uh, desperate for solutions and people uh, feeling that their children might be at risk of this uh, ideological infection or pandemic that's spreading. Um, but, and here, and then the, the, the tough question comes in or the more the dilemma comes in and that's what how do you respond to this type of building pressure how do you respond to uh for example the speech of malema or the the type of uh, threatening messages that you get from uh, the the ruling party um what is the the, the best response to these types of uh, conundrums or to this building pressure from AfriForum's perspective mm. in a similar way to, for example, Senegal or Brackenfell and the inevitable uh, future confrontations that will definitely occur? Well, I, I think the solution is twofold, and that's what AfriForum's strategy is, is we need to have a, a um, we always say, fach and bow in Afrikaans, fight and bow. We need to be able to fight against these injustices, like filing these complaints and making sure that people are prosecuted 
and fighting against expropriation without compensation and campaigning that farm murders be a priority crime and going across the world and you know lobbying people and getting people to speak out about what's happening all of this is sort of part of the fight strategy and it's very important that we must do that but that's almost it's more a tactic really than a strategy the strategy the long-term solution and the only sustainable way for for minorities and, and for Afrikaners for that matter to to have a future in this country is to build our own institutions and to have control over our own institutions and to claim that dominion um, to say listen we're not I mean we can fight we can and we must fight against language discrimination at public universities but at the same time we can also just build our own university that's a private university that's owned by us where we make the rules um, and it's not also obviously there are some bumps in the road because there's some a private university is also regulated to an extent but it's not the same thing as a public university you have much more freedom to determine curriculum and so forth um, and and the same goes for everything else i mean we can be we can be angry about for example how the media is reporting on the on some of these things ideologically and we should take them to the press ombudsman and so forth if they if they publish fake news which is part of the fight strategy but at the same time let's just build our own media institutions um, and the same goes for a variety of things i think one one other thing maybe to add to that is um, if we talk about Afrikaners in particular, our problem, Flip Bice always says, our problem is not that we are so few. We're actually, there's actually a great many of us. There are millions of us, which makes us a very big nation. Um, our problem is that we are in the minority everywhere we are. So, so we need to re recognize that part of the solution, or well, what that means, sorry, what that means effectively is everywhere we are, we are in the minority, which means there's no place where we actually have some form of governmental control so if we want to have a um, uh, a sustainable future part of the solution must be to concentrate in other words to move concentrate i mean physically in other words to move as we move i mean i've moved probably 10 times in my life and um, uh, people move that's just part of of life but if we move we must rather move to places where, where we are more where we can increase in numbers so that we can form a majority within a particular territorial area. Um, I think that it's controversial to say, but it's, it's certainly part of, part of the solution. Mm. Uh, I just wanted to uh, break a little bit from the from the topic and just say I saw Kevin Freeze in the in the chat and I remember his very tragic story of uh, when he talked on, I think, um, Ronaldo Hosts' channel uh, about, and I think Chris White's channel as well, about uh, the destruction of his business. I uh, hope things are going well there and uh, things are looking better and looking up on your side, Kevin. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, and then, Adam, uh, maybe as a, a final thought uh, before we close out, uh, AFRI Forum, in regards to what we do internationally and domestically, uh, it's all because of our members that make it possible. But uh, how can people support AFRI Forum if they are, for example, living abroad and not uh, South African? Yes. So we are working on a, a big plan. To, to get people who are abroad, to empower them to be able to contribute more frequently. Um, but the main way is to become a friend of AfriForum. So if you live in South Africa, you can become a member of AfriForum through our website, um, or you can contact us in any other way and we can assist you with that. But if you live abroad, you can go to friendsofafriforum.com. And on that website, you can fill in your details and you can make a contribution. And I think people abroad watching must remember that if you live in the US, for example, for you to give, to make a debit order, to give, make a monthly donation of $10, it's not going to have such a big impact for you. But $10, $10 in the US isn't that much. But $10 in South Africa is a lot. Um, so, so I think it's it almost, it's an exponential growth in terms of what we get, at least if you look at it from that perspective. The same goes for if you, if you, if you have a salary and you you get paid in euros or in pounds or whatever you can make a small monthly donation to africa forum and um to help us with the work that we're doing and it could have a, it could have a much bigger impact in our country than that money would have in your country so we really want to encourage people to do that so that we can continue with these court cases and make sure that these people are prosecuted and so that we can continue with our international campaigns and um, make sure that we, we inform the world about what is happening in South africa I saw today in the South African, they reported on uh, the, the, the 
the complaint that we're going to lay against Malema tomorrow at the, in the, at the police. And uh, they called us the, uh, the old foe of uh, Julius Malema. So it seems like uh, every forum is definitely a, a thorn in his side. But uh, like yeah. I said earlier, unfortunately, uh, the, the law moves very slowly in, uh, in South Africa. So it, I wish we could have uh, overnight successes or overnight results, uh, but that's just uh, not the way things work. So it's a patient process. It takes years sometimes. Um, that's just a reality we have to deal with. Yeah. No, that's that's uh, when we had these discussions in 2011, um, um, where actually they signed this agreement that they were stopping the song. Um, I remember when the whole thing was finished, uh, we went to, I might have told this story before, we went to, you know, I went to the restroom and Malema came in and we were washing our hands next to each other at the basin and Malema made a joke. It was at the time when he was being fired uh, or expelled from the ANC. Again, importantly, not for racism. We made all these racist approaches comments. He was expelled from the ANC for criticizing Jacob Zuma. Um, and then he said, no, no, he, he, he won't have a job for much longer. Maybe he can come and work for Afri Forum. And I said to him, he's already working for Afri Forum. He just doesn't know it. <laughs> um, because with all these comments that he makes, he's, he's encouraging people to join Afri Forum and he's strengthening Afri Forum as a consequence as well. Um, but he immediately got, he understood what I was saying to him, so he, he got the joke. But, but that is the reality. Yes, you're right. Um, the law um, moves, justice moves slowly in Africa, um, but I do think we are making progress. I mean, we've had him in court now. We've had Black First Land First in court now. Uh, we are going to use the settlement uh, uh, now against Palema. So, so there is some progress on this. And, and I, I think I, I really am. I'm not. I'm actually not an opportunistic person by nature. But I am you mean, uh, you mean optimistic, Adams, not opportunistic. Uh, sorry, optimistic, yes. <laughs> optimistic, not opportunistic. Um, I'm not optimistic by nature, but I'm optimistic about, about this. Um, if we acknowledge that it is going to take take time, I know we're going to, to, to I'm, I'm convinced that there's going to be a significant outcome in this. Well, Adams, uh, thank you very much for giving us some of your valuable time tonight to give some uh, to shine some light in regards to what's going on behind the scenes uh, and how uh, Afri Forum is fighting the good fight. And then also thank you very much to everyone that tuned in tonight. Um, thank you for everyone that left a like. It helps out the show. And if you're new and you like these types of conversations, you can go subscribe. Uh, and maybe I'll see you next week uh, as well. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, all the best for the future, and also good luck tomorrow. Uh, I hope you, uh, I hope you are on Malema's nightmares tonight, and then uh, we'll chat again real soon. Uh, Moi Thank you, Bye, Dante. Like a and thank you for everyone in the chats also. <laughs>